let's talk about six hidden messages in Andor's first episode. They're all tied to visual and verbal cues, such as fire, corporate versus blue collar, the color white, the hounds, lying, and characters standing over one another. Andor is the first high quality Star Wars project ever with recurring motifs and themes we can spot and analyze. I blame veteran head writer Tony Gilroy for giving us such a quality show. Without further ado, let's get into the hidden messages of episode one, one by one, fire. When Cassian's a boy on Canari, he lives amongst a tribe of other children. Before they go out on a hunting mission, they smear themselves with ashes from their fire. Fire is important to this show, I think. Ferrix is a highly industrialized planet featuring houses made of bricks. To make bricks, you need to mix, mold, and burn them in a furnace, right? And later we find out that the dead on Ferrix become bricks themselves. They get cremated, and their ashes are then mixed with mortar, turning them into bricks. We have to look at the clothing of people on Ferrix as well. They wear a mix of red, orange, and yellow colors predominantly, the colors of fire. Cassian himself wears a dark red jacket, and his droid is dark red as well. And what color are bricks? I don't need to answer that one. What about the wall of gloves? There's a mix of yellow, red, and orange present here. It's fitting. The people of Ferrix represent the ember of early rebellion that eventually catches fire across the galaxy. What better thing than fire to act as a metaphor for the rebel cause? Corporate versus blue collar. The first scene takes place on Morlana 1 in the Priox Morlana corporate zone. Priox Morlana is a corporate entity that the Empire hired to act as a governing body in the sector Ferrix exists in. Contrasting Morlana to Ferrix is fascinating. Priox Morlana is a corporate entity. Ferrix is a planet of blue collar workers. Morlana's offices have a ton of white light that shines through windows built above them. Ferrix is more colorful with its reds, oranges, and yellows, and it's also darker. There's not a lot of light that gets in through their dense brick buildings. You could see this difference in transparency in two ways. One, Morlana can see all. In one scene, Cyro Karn checks flight logs with a co-worker. They stare at a transparent screen and pinpoint the ship Cassian took to visit Morlana 1. His ship is shown in yellow, by the way. They're able to see everything. The second way we can interpret this design difference is through the lens of fragility. The Empire is fragile in this series, and they're fragile because they're lazy, cocky, and arrogant. Set up a desk here to monitor anything that comes in. Let's go! That arrogance creates ignorance, which is something the Rebels exploit to their advantage. If you threw a brick at a glass window, it would shatter. If you threw a brick at a brick, it bounced off it like a bullet off the Incredible Hulk. And episode one of Andor makes it a point to show how lazy these corporate workers actually are. The only one who's actually doing anything is Cyro Karn, which is annoying for the audience since we want Andor to get away with everything. The people of Ferrix, though, are hard workers, tough, resilient, strong, like bricks. They represent a way of life, a set of values that's stronger and more durable than the cockiness of the Empire. If you listen closely to the music on Ferrix, you can hear sounds of tools clanking and banging together as the heart and soul of the beat. Not to mention the colors of Marlana's corporate uniforms are blue, a color diametrically opposed to the reds of people on Ferrix. You could interpret blue as a cold, rigid color, which is exactly how the Empire is, cold and rigid. One guy on Marlana 1 is even eating blue noodles, and the ship log that Cyril Karn looks at with his associate is blue too. The color white. The first shot of Andor is a dolly of bright white lights passing by as Andor walks across a deck. He hides his face from them with a hood. In Morlana corporate offices, a lot of white light cascades through the windows above. The Empire in Star Wars represents white, of course, a color that we'll see more of in the infamous jail Andor gets trapped in, and the meeting room where Empire leaders meet. They rule with an iron fist, they have very strict rules on what is and isn't allowed. There's no freedom or nuance with them, 
only rules black and white. These color design choices create a very interesting dichotomy between the cold, rigid nature of the Empire and the fiery, passionate nature of the Rebels. The Hounds My favorite scene of this episode is when the Corellian Hounds come running into the street and pee on B2 Emo. <laughs> then B2 shocks them. By the way, electricity, that's something that'll show up later in the show. Believe that. Anyway, I think the Hounds are a representation of the Empire. They're figuratively taking a piss on the entire galaxy, and too stupid to see that the people they're pissing on are more than capable of defending themselves. Why put this scene in the episode? For comic relief? I don't think so. I think a writer as good as Tony Gilroy put this in there as a way to show something more. Lying. In the very next scene, Cassian asks B2 Emo to make a lie. Listen to me, it's important. I know it takes a lot of energy, but can you make a lie for me? I can lie. I have adequate power reserves. There's actually a lot of lying in this episode on all sides. Cassian visits Brasso, and they create a story together about how they went out and got drunk the night before. Chief Hine makes up a lie about how the two officers that Cassian killed actually died in an accident. Cassian isn't entirely truthful with Bix about parts he has to sell, and doesn't tell the hangar dude where he took his ship. Lying is important in Andor. There's a lot more where that came from throughout this series, obviously. But I do want to zero in on the point that lying takes a lot of energy for droids. It takes a lot of energy for humans, too. It's almost like you have to work twice as hard at all times, since you're doing the thing you're lying about and making up a suitable story that covers up the lie. This fact raises the stakes of this show a good deal higher, making it so much harder for our protagonists. And like I said before, Ferrix is a dark planet with lots of alleyways, corridors, and buildings with little to no windows for light to pierce through. I think this reinforces the idea that Bix, Brasso, Cassian, and more people on Ferrix are straining themselves to cover a lot of stuff up. Characters standing over one another. Andor Episode 1 features a lot of conversations where one person is higher than another. Cyril Karn is a perfect example. In his first meeting with Chief Hine, he's visually higher than him most of the time, representing his deeper commitment to the cause than his own chief, who doesn't care that two of his men were just killed. Cyril interacts twice more with grunt workers that are framed below him, once when finding Cassian's ship on the ship logs, and another when he tries to motivate a few workers to find more information about Cassian's whereabouts. His feet are literally where their heads are in this scene. When Cassian fights the two Primor employees, he relishes the power he has over them by shouting, Tell me now! Tell me what to do! Let's hear it, boss! Get up! Get him up! He stands over them in this scene. Even when he asks Brasso to lie for him, Brasso stands over him, almost in an intimidating fashion, as they make up a lie together. Later, somebody tries to get Cassian to give him money, using a big friend of Cassian's as added intimidation. <laughs> Finally, what about the ending scene where Cassian talks down to the shipyard groundskeeper from Height? Not only are there a lot of visual power dynamics, but spoken ones. Chief Hine laments about one of the murdered Primor employees who fell a long way in the chain of command. I know one of these men. Crevas. It's another reason I wanted to make sure this got the most immediate attention. He was a squad commander on four. He's obviously fallen a great deal since then. He was a sentry corporal here on one. Chief Hine himself needs to go report to the Empire, and he even tells Cyril to not put his feet up on the desk while he's gone. Don't put your feet on my desk in my absence and let's have an accident report waiting when I get back. Not to mention the fact that Cassian wants to get into contact with Bix's buyer immediately someone who's literally at the top of the rebel chain of command. And what does Bix have to do to contact this mysterious figure? She must climb a ladder and hack into a communications relay to send a message to him. She must literally get higher on this planet to reach her superior. Then we have the scene of Cassian as a boy who wants to be a part of the scouting party, but initially gets turned down by a boy sitting next to him. Andor will continue to play with height and climbing and power dynamics throughout the show, so stay tuned on that. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm going to be releasing a breakdown for every episode of Andor moving forward, so subscribe to my channel if you want to get them. 
Also, consider subscribing to my Substack newsletter. The link is down below in the description. It's free. I'd love to hear what you thought of Andor Episode 1 and Andor as a series in general down below in the comments section. Thank you all for watching. See you next time.